Well, without further ado, um, we have an apology from Zali Stegel. She is unable to uh, attend our, our uh, conference this afternoon. Uh, but uh, we have the kind offer from Harry Martin, who is uh, a, a clean technology specialist and currently advisor to Zali. Uh, his, uh, his background is from... Uh, he has a master's in environmental management and sustainability. He, uh, he, his first job was with Tesla. I'd be interested to hear about that job. That would be a wonderful job, I think. Uh, and he's moved from there to business and development uh, and strategy with uh, Everty and, uh, and is now a political consultant working for Zali. And we'd like to really welcome you along here, Harry. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? All right. We can. Thank you. Great. Great. Well, thanks for having me and thank you for moving everything online rather than cancelling. Uh, I suppose this is the new normal for the foreseeable future. Uh, which be an it's an interesting time. Uh, Zali obviously apologises for not attending. We're, we're actually urgently going through the draft stimulus package legislation to be presented on uh, tomorrow. And it's also looking likely they'll try and put through another uh, a number of other bills that are pretty important as well on um, tomorrow and on Tuesday. So as you mentioned, um, Tom, I'm Harry. I'm one of Zali's advisors. I've been with her since the early days of the campaign. Uh, my background is in renewable energy, electric vehicles and the environment. Uh, I develop Zali's climate policies. I advise her closely on, on, on this and other matters. I, I do her climate strategy help her with the political strategy, um, write her speeches, review legislation, do all that kind of stuff. So I just think, I, I actually wrote this speech for Zali, so, but I suppose I should just do it myself. Um, um, it's been a pretty ominous start to the year, uh, bushfires, drought, and now the shadow of coronavirus looming over the world. Um, despite the obvious disruption to our social lives and the economy, the pandemic crisis is finally giving the environment a chance to breathe. Um, air pollution is dropping over Europe and China. Even the waterways of Venice are calm and fish are returning. It's also giving us a chance to breathe and reflect um, somewhat forcibly. And it's pretty unprecedented. It's completely unprecedented in this century. Um, there's no doubt that many aspects of our lives will change from this point onwards. Our work life aspects of consumerism, even global politics will change dramatically. Um, issues like universal healthcare, welfare, industrial relations will all be seen in a new light as governments now come to rely on them out of complete necessity. Uh, it is unlikely this crisis will be over until there's a vaccine. Um, there's now a global vaccine un race underway. Hopefully, I see this as hopefully by listening to the scientists on this issue, it will bolster the argument for listening on climate change. This is all happening at the foreground of our lives and I know many of our lives have been disrupted. Um, but behind the scenes, I feel like we're at a, we have been at a climate tipping point, if, if ever so slowly moving forward. Investors are responding to new requirements on climate risk and disclosures. They're quietly moving their portfolios rapidly in the direction of sustainable solutions for energy, transport and food. The exodus of investors has meant thing, tes, shares like Tesla have reached record highs while ExxonMobil and other fossil fuel majors are continuing their, their decline. Added to this, the disruption to global supply chains and trade, trade uh, due to this crisis is having a few, huge effect on oil and ga gas production and values. Um, the subsequent effect of Saudi and Russian price wars and the global slowdown and drop in price of oil mean that many greenfield LNG projects will now be simply unviable, including some projects around Australia. The pause of, caused by this virus may allow further deflation in the price of renewables and other zero emissions technologies. Um, they will be allowed to further catch up. It could be impossible for fossil fuels to return to previous production levels. Compounding this, the bushfires and the awful images projected around the world and around the world focus the public attention on drastic impacts of just a warmer, one degree warmer world. Somehow, somehow, I don't think this crisis has wiped those memories away. And for many in Australia, 
it's still an ongoing problem as they return to their, try to return to their normal lives. Governments will continue to feel the pressure to increase their nationally determined contributions and commit to a net zero target by 2050 uh, before the next conference of the parties in Glasgow or whenever it is viable in the current circumstances. While the current, while the last dec decade for Australia was a decade wasted, 2020, 2021 could be a period where we cross the Rubicon on climate action and endorse sensible policies to get us to net zero by 2050. Although many people see this crisis as a climate setback, we could use this crisis as an opportunity to completely reset our systems and embrace the net zero emissions economy. Although we have put the bill on pause um, that we intend to present until a, a more suitable time, our Climate Change National Framework for Adaptation and Mitigation Bill 2020, which I've been developing, um, could break the deadlock on climate inaction and propose a bipartisan way forward for this country that takes advantage of this reset. This bill is not revolutionary in that it is modelled on the United Kingdom's Climate Change Act, which has been in force for over 10 years, as well as New Zealand's Climate Change Response Zero Carbon Amendment Bill, which came into force late last year. Since the UK enacted their bill, they've managed to put climate politics behind them. They now have general consensus, have grown their economy, embraced solutions to the challenge like offshore, um, offshore wind, and electrified transport and have taken a leadership role on climate on the world stage. Symbolic of how far they've come, it was amazing to watch um, both parties in the recent UK election compete not just on the costs of action, um, but they actually um, were instead competing on ambition. Indeed, the Conservatives, and we met with the UK High Commission um, several times to discuss our bill, um, they intend to use decisive climate action to reassert their bona fides on the world stage post Brexit um, to re re restore their credibility. We thought we could emulate, emulate that in Australia. Um, similarly, in 2005, a private member also tabled the first iteration of their Climate Change Act three years before it became law. So I'll go through the bill components really quickly. To be effective, um, we think Australia needs an independent arbiter to guide policy and provide cru cru crucial accountability. The Act will establish a climate change commission to advise the government on policy setting and reporting based on the advice of experts, including business economics, agriculture, regional development, um, climate policy, climate science. Um, this kind of body has been extremely successful in the UK and I just, had a call last week with somebody who worked on the UK Climate Com Commission, and it continues to be a credible listen to um, body um, that's really helping them with their transition. Unfortunately, we have a body like this in Australia, Climate Change Authority, but its funding was gutted and is no longer listened to by the government. Um, it's bored, so we need to start fresh. Um, the CCC, or the Climate Change Commission, the Commission, will have stronger powers than the Climate Change Authority, firstly by mandating that the government consider the advice and recommendations of the Commission whenever it sets climate policy and does so visibly. Um, if the government rejects the advice of the Commission, it will have to provide a statement of reasons, rejecting, clearly outlining why. Um, secondly, it empowers the Commission to report and review on government policy without referral by the Minister, which is actually a problem for the current authority. It requires a referral by the Minister or the direction from the Minister. The net zero target, um, in line with the Paris Agreement and Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is best available science. This act will establish a net zero target by 2050 in statute. By having the goal in statute, business and investors can be confident that the government is heading in the right direction, moving in line with the states, territories, our international peers, and can plan decisions accordingly and manage financial risk. This is not new. It's something the states, territories, and other countries have enacted in either statute or policy. Investors and businesses are also increasingly considered climate aligned targets for their portfolios, including net zero by 2050. Importantly, the target, target has the ability to be ramped up if there's significant change in the science and global action and technology. Then the bill establishes five year emissions budgets the, um, to get to net zero. Um, it will require the government to set these emissions budgets based on the advice of the commission which considers various factors like technology readiness and the best available science. Um, to meet these budgets, the government will then provide five yearly emissions reduction plans, 
one year in, in advance and to allow for added security uh, scrutiny. These plans will be multi-sectoral, dealing with energy, agriculture, waste, transport, um, industry, um, uh, anything um, that is significantly emissions intensive. Um, the bill will then require, um, so unfortunately, as evidenced by the fires, Australia is uniquely susceptible to impacts. So it's important that uh, the community and the private sector understand the full extent of those risks. So the, the Act will provide regular risk assessments um, conducted by the Commission, um, which will identify risks across Australia's society, economy and environment, and to which the Commonwealth will have to respond. Uh, the risk assessments will be underpinned by the advice of experts. The government will be required to develop adaptation plans, which will set up the government's priorities in addressing those risks. These assessments and plans will guide businesses, um, community and uh, investors' decision making. Um, so it's really important that we also have transparent monitoring and, and reporting. We saw this as a key gap in the current approach. Nobody's sure when reports come out, what they mean, they're housed everywhere. Um, so we think um, is to assist this, um, the government and the commission will have to work together on adaptation plans, long-term targets, interim budgets, mitigation plans in a transparent, accountable way. Um, the Commission will then actually have to report on all those measures and how they're being implemented regularly, and it'll be housed on a central website. So how do we get this done? Um, we've actually put the campaign in on pause um, due to current circumstances. We were intending to introduce the bill on tomorrow, but uh, the tomorrow's, um, proceedings will be primarily to deal with the stimulus packages. So um, until last, until this week, we're actually calling on the bill to be a free vote. We held a number of um, productive meetings with Labor, um, the crossbench, um, some interesting characters, you know, Pauline Hanson, Barnaby Joyce, uh, Bob Cutter, very interesting, fruitful discussions. Um, so we're calling on all those members to, to, to elect their, um, to represent their electorates. Um, and vote um, uh, not necessarily with their parties, but according um, to their values and the values of their electorates. Because we actually see this as a matter of safety for many Australians and sh it should now be elevated above party politics. Um, we also built a website, which I'm sure you've probably, a lot of you have seen right, um, by now. It's climateactnow.com.au. Uh, the website's still going. You can't send a message to your MP at the moment because we don't want to flood the inboxes while we're going through this important time. But it basically acts as a de facto plebiscite. I think 77,000 Australians have already signed up. Um, and that was going up by about 3,000, 4,000 a day until the coronavirus crisis hit and everybody kind of you know, went into their bunkers. Um, so we're now trying to figure out uh, an online only, only digital strategy to go um, to, when these when this kind of this situation settles down and and the sh econ initial economic shock subsides, you know most people will be at home and and be um, you know I think quite amenable to discussions about the future. You know the, it's a really good time for us to kind of reset and rebuild and gain support, um, even if it's online. So what is really great having initial discussions with Peter um, from from your organisation about how you can support. Um, I urge the rest of you to reach out to your network and use the rest of this time, um, which could, you know, this, this situation could drag on for six to 12 months um, to shore up support for your climate initiatives and um, potentially ours. Um, we're going to do that. Um, so uh, we really believe that this law, although it's on ice at the moment, will be setting up Australia's foundation um, for climate action and should allow us um, to reset. Um, and basically, hopefully, by the time the next Glasgow or Conference of the Parties comes around, um, we can show ourselves and the world that we're serious and that we um, uh, can return as world leaders um, on this issue. Um, so that's all I've got. But if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. So I can't uh, hear you. Thank you very much, Harry. Uh, no That's uh, a, a great overview, a uh, uh, great lead in, and it's an, a very important bill that you are putting together. Uh, we uh, 
certainly would be very supportive of this bill, I believe. Now, there may be some questions out there. Um, how are we going with questions? Uh, we, we're collecting those online in the background. Uh, um, Catherine, do you have yes. something there? Could please? I unmute you, Arif, and let you put your question because you'll do that for a few people? Yeah, I'm happy to answer some questions. Yep, go ahead. Fantastic. I know your question. Oh yeah, sure. Um, so I'm at UNSW, and there's a lot of student groups, young people here, and I even know younger people from the schools. And their main issue with Zai's bill is that the 2050 talk is a bit too late, and it makes yeah. it a week. So we mm -hmm. want to know your perspective on why is it 2050? Like 2050, I know for a large portion of Australian population. It's just, you, you don't have a feel for it. It's like so far away. It's like 30 years from now. Mm. So, yeah, that's uh, one of my main questions. Yeah, and that's certainly, you know, the feedback that we've heard um, from many stakeholders who want to see faster action. Um, first of all, the IPCC literature at the moment endorses a global net zero by 2050 and certain economies will move faster um, than others. Um, but this is an important, it's an important starting point. Um, it's endorsed by the states, the territories, investors, businesses. Um, every every state and territory in Australia now has a net zero target by 2050. Um, so it's really important to see it, that we're moving in concert with others. Um, that's not to say that we actually internally don't support a stronger target, but you've got to start somewhere. And with the way things are moving, it's likely that, um, you know, action will, you know, increase exponentially. Um, but, you know, in Australia, we still have MPs arguing for a 2078, you know, coalition MPs starting uh, arguing for a 2070 target. So we just got to get it in place. The bill has important provisions to allow for a ratcheting up. Um, it's got clauses in there to say, um, if there's significant change in global action or climate policy or science, there's really broad range of factors. Um, the minister um, can actually vary the target um, through regulation so but he actually he can't reduce it so we we recognize we don't want to actually reduce our ambitions we want to we want to increase we want to you know have an acceleration over time so if we just put it in if we just get it locked down 2050 it no doubt uh, over the next decade um uh, it will accelerate so um that's the and so in order to build, build this broad coalition we needed to keep it you know down the center 2050 in line with states in line with the ipcc and then we can go from there. Thank you, Harry. Any, any more questions there? Uh, I see uh, Jenny's raised her hand, but uh, you've got some more questions there, Catherine. I think we were going to offer, there's a name on the screen, Simone. Who's that? Howard, do you want to do Simone's question for us? Yeah, sure. Um, Simone, are you there? Um, I did see a message come through after the pandemic. Won't governments be inclined to just uh, start up fossil fuel because it's the most expedient? Um, is, that a fair, uh, is that a fair summary of your question? Okay, I can't see him now. Anyway, that was the question. Well, thanks. Thanks, um, Simone. Uh, that was, you know, I have I had my own concerns about that, um, and I have been talking to some people, and I I, I think th this is the the view I, I'm ha I have at the moment is an optimistic view is that during this time um, there's obviously going to be, and I referred to it earlier in my speech. There's been a slowdown in um, trade, and, and therefore uh, uh, trade. There's been a slowdown in people's general activity most people are staying at home um they're not driving um people aren't catching public transport flights uh, uh are stopping and i think that's been a really good cause for global emissions and i think actually many companies um who were marginal fossil fuel players and who'd taken on a lot of debt will really really struggle to to come back from this because this could last for you know, the economic ramifications of this could be up to two years. 
And so I think it will wipe out a lot of smaller players and actually probably some big ones because um, we've lost, you know, shareholder, uh, the, you know, the um, market valuation and, and value of major fossil fuel players has been kind of wiped out over the last few years already. And I think this will actually act to accelerate it. Um, and I actually think importantly during this time that, uh, it, it, you know, research and development and, 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 and construction on renewables and that kind of stuff in the pipeline and that it's already baked in will still go ahead. So uh, I think, you know, we'll still see further deflation in like the cost of batteries coming down, the cost of renewables, um, the cost of um, hydrogen produced from uh, you, you, you uh, from renewables, that, that kind of stuff will continue to go down. So I think, you know, two years is a long time in, in technology space. So I think that it really can, uh, this could be a, a really important pause for the sector to catch up and actually overtake. Um, and, and, you know, by 2022, 2023, um, you know, you've got new model EVs that Volkswagen are pushing out. They'll start arriving in Australia. They'll be price comparable to petrol vehicles. I think the government, this government in particular, will find it really, really hard unless China decides to do a huge... Um, infrastructure investment stimulus package to in, and using Australians Australia's coal, I think it'll be really really hard for the government to push that push fossil fuels even harder because the alternative is getting stronger. So I think that where there is a risk to go hard on the status quo, um, we've actually also seen the government drop its position on a number of things, a number of really interesting things. So like their position on social welfare, they boosted New Start, um, doubled it for um, for job seekers, called it job seekers. So they're, they're, their position on welfare is changing, their position on, um, on, 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 on yeah, social security is changing. It, you know, this virus may allow the government cover to change a number of their positions. I mean, the economic positions are, you know, the fact that they were riding the, the Labor Party for the last 10 years on their stimulus package during the GFC and all of a sudden now they're in, endorsing Labor type Keynesian stimulus and social welfare policies is a huge change. So I think we'll see a lot of morphing of the government position and it may actually um, cascade into um, into into uh, climate policy. Um, I'm hopefully optimistic. So... Um, yeah, hopefully, you know, there, there, there's reason for optimism and they won't just go business as usual. Fantastic. Harrison, there's so much interest. If we had been in a conference room, you'd be peppered. <laughs> be peppered. But we have to line the questions up one by one, oh, so I'm going to roll a bunch together. Yeah. Um, Zali's bill, as everybody talks about it as, Zali's bill, self-explanatory. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, what is Zali's position on carbon CFD, carbon fee and dividend? What should the price be? And is it even constitutional to have a climate commission making decisions? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, okay. So the first question, what's that? So the carbon... Uh, fee dividend. Um, I think it is, that's a UNSW policy that was, I think, announced a couple of years ago. That's I think right. I, I, I think I actually went to the the um, unveiling of that policy at UNSW. It was really interesting. Um, although you know, it's a great idea, and and certainly I think that I mean, undoubtedly, carbon pricing is the most efficient and effective way for sector wide emissions reduction. Unfortunately, we've found ourselves in a position in Australia where it's become completely politically unpalatable. And we've kind of wedged ourselves on it and it's ridiculous. We've taken one of our most important tools. Um, so we're kind of operating with one hand behind our back. That's not to say that we can't do the task without it. It would just be a lot easier if we had it. You know, the UK has it, New Zealand has it, Canada has it in several provinces. Yeah. It would be great, and I and I really support the fact that it would it would it would um, reimburse people 
um, for the extra prices from carbon intensive goods, like putting it back into the people. And I think that was a real flaw in the design of the last carbon tax because it, it didn't go back to the people, which would have made it politically a lot safer because if the government went to remove it, that people would be rightly irritated and they'd lose votes. So in a political way, it's sensibly designed to safeguard from future repealing. Whether we, we're not currently publicly supporting that kind of um, mechani mechanism at the moment for obvious reasons, we come from the seat where the guy, you know, the chief architect of repealing it is the former member. So we're not yeah. going to be championing it. We hope that by in implementing a climate change commission that, that reviews and suggests policy that it will continue to barrack for currently politically unpalatable options like a carbon pricing mechanism. Um, because it's better, it comes from an independent voice like the RBA. The RBA says, hey, we need to do more fiscal reforms and people go, okay, we'll, we'll listen. Um, so we hope that putting the commission in, they'll advocate for these sensible policies. And eventually when climate impacts keep accelerating, people keep you know, voting for climate action, eventually sensible policies will kind of come back in. So that's our position on a carbon dividend. Um, in terms of your second question regarding the constitutionality or the constitution, constitutional validity of our bill, um, we've had it checked by a number of constitutional experts. Um, and I think we had three or four separate pieces of advice on constitutional validity. It's, it's, it's very sound. Um, it's, you know, relies on several sections of the constitution for its powers. The commission doesn't contravene the, 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 the powers of the commission don't contravene uh, any ex anything in the constitution no. or um, so there's no, there's no risk. That, that's Brilliant. how I would. Yeah. And then there's a tiny question mark on the end of that. Jason Felinski apparently had a piece in the Herald, which you're doubtless familiar with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know what I think, but um, what's the constitutionality of the commission? Well, look, the, the, there's no limit on the minister's executive powers and we've actually amended. So we'll be releasing over the next few months, an amended bill where we've further legally clarified the provisions that people like Jason Felinski were concerned about and, and, and hopefully um, neutralize that argument. I think they were referring, they were concerned particularly about the ability for the, needing the commission's recommendation to adjust the 2050 target. Um, so we've adjusted that clause to make it clearer, clearer. So that, I mean, not that that at all limits the constitutional validity of the bill. We've right. just done a few edits to make it, you know, to, to make it more proof, uh, you know, foolproof and, 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 and um, defensible. So especially in the high court, if it ever got there. So um, I, 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 broadly speaking, the bill relies on, um, what they call the executive affairs of the constitution, executive affairs powers of the constitution, mm -hmm. which allows government to enact legislation, which gives effect to treaties, international agreements and all that kind of stuff. So this bill, we basically spell it out in it is basically to give effect to our obligations under the Paris agreement. So there's no reason if you're following and hopefully I'm not being too technical. There's no reason like it has, enough power built into it because it's meeting the obligations of the Paris Agreement to basically withhold any attack on constitutional grounds. Brilliant. Well, that gives us yep. the technical, say, you know, like what we can say when we yeah. come against that. And sure. another question about uh, what is the process you expect for the bill when you do get a chance to bring it in? Uh, so the political pathway is... Um, well, our original political pathway was introduce it tomorrow. Um, we were looking at referring it to a committee, um, referring or establishing a, special, a, a select committee to look into the bill. Um, and that would give the public um, a, an ability to write, you know, present, uh, go to public hearings, write submissions. Um, it would give everybody added scrutiny and we could have a debate. Uh, and so we really wanted to push initially for a debate. Um, 
we recognize it's not we're not going to vote on it straight away it, it, you know as as the shadow um climate change minister mark butler says said to me this is a pretty significant reform so it needs to be duly considered um so we would push it for a committee um and we see the process now it was going to go till october i don't really know what's going to happen with this virus it looks like Parliament won't be in, in session, uh, will be in emergency sessions only to pass certain legislation. So I don't imagine the next six months will be viable. So it kind of pushes out our time frame. But our initial thoughts were push it to a committee, um, have a debate within the parameters of the committee, have public hearings, allow coalition members to ask questions of stakeholders about certain clauses they had concerns with. Um, and that way would give it life. Um, and then, you know, after a certain period, amend the bill if it needs to be amended and then say, um, basically, where do you guys all stand on this? Uh, especially the coalition, you know, do you support this bill and further climate action? Would we would, we would probably move to suspend standing orders in the house and force it to a vote um, after the committee process. That's what it would look like. Um, but it's actually already been selected. So what they call is like it gets selected. So it's already on the agenda in parliament. Um, there's no risk of not being able to introduce it. It's just waiting. It's just sitting there waiting to be, to be, to, for the go ahead. Fabulous. Actually that little bit of time might give us a chance for more discussion behind the scenes and more time for us to get in there and support it. Eh? Absolutely. Um, Howard, give me a second opinion. How much time have we got, Tom? We've got time. Well, that's um, entirely up to uh, Harry. We uh, we just on two thirty three. We've got another well, another seventeen minutes if we want to use it. Um, oh, there are people uh, asking. But, uh, but unfortunately, I can't see who the people are who are putting their hands up. So I know the interest is out there. Um. There was, uh, there was a question, I don't know whether it's totally uh, uh, supportive or whether it's an appropriate question, but uh, uh, I've forgotten her name, who had her hand up earlier, um, wanted to ask about uh, CCS as a solution. Um, Jenny was saying that uh, I heard Julia King talk about the UK legislation and it included CCS as one measure of drawing down CO2. Is CCS in the stable proposal now? I, I know that it won't be because it's a technology, but maybe I'm wrong. What would you say to that, Harry? Well, look, with this legislation, we're not precluding any, it's technology neutral. Um, so it's whatever the market kind of decides is viable, really. Um, so we don't have any, I mean, we have views on specific technologies, but we need to be technology agnostic because we recognise that people have their own views. You know, the coalition certainly love um, their carbon capture and storage and all that kind of stuff, whereas other people prefer renewables and that's fine. So we really wanted to have a neutral approach um, and let the market kind of decide what's viable. Um, however, in terms of carbon capture and storage specifically, uh, we've already pumped a billion and a half dollars in subsidies to carbon capture storage projects and research and, and it hasn't been viable as of yet. Um, it may be really instrumental in the future in helping us decarbonize heavy industry. Um, but we're yet to see any good projects um, basically come online. Um, so if it doesn't stack up, economically it would be very difficult to get it up without significant government subsidies uh, but if it took you know carbon capture and storage to decarbonize manufacturing and industrial processing of course we would support it of course um, but it's 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 at the moment it's just not working <laughs> okay Dennis, did you have a question you wanted to put? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Harry. It was great. No um, what I'm thinking about is 
more strategic uh, from a CCL's point of view. Um, you're talking about the, the success or not of the build uh, going forward. As an organisation, the way we work, we can attempt to optimise uh, our, 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 our procedures and our, our process to, to help that happen. So if, if we can have a communication with you and Zali on how best we can help that process, uh, I think that would be to an advantage for, for the bill itself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Dennis. Yeah, ab absolutely. And um, uh, I know we had an initial discussion with Peter and we we're talking about political strategy and potentially your groups, um, you know, meeting with MPs physically. Um, I don't know if that's going to be viable. Uh, I, I think, I think, I think what the way we should look at this situation at the moment is, is it's basically all hands to the pump on 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 the virus and economically you know making sure australians are on their feet and supported however in this time we can still um you know ordinary business still goes on so i would encourage you know your mem your your members and and everybody to still um you know maybe talk to your mps have virtual meetings where you can um uh, and do that, but yeah, ongoing. Um, absolutely happy to keep working with you and talk political strategy and um, pressure and that kind of stuff and what we're doing. Absolutely. Okay, so if let's let's assume that the bill does not go forward, then this becomes even more important for the bill to go to be eventually successful. So, I guess what I'm saying from my own point of view, I commit myself to to move that forward. And I'm sure there's a lot of other folk who are on here now will also do the same. So mm. uh, anything we can do, we're here. We're here. all here. Thanks, Dennis. I'm going to jump yeah. in here, Harrison. But there's a few yep. people asking, um, it won't be put. And I understood you to say that it has been listed or something, so it will happen. But that doesn't necessarily mean it'll get through the parliament, but it, it is going to be put at some stage to the, to the parliament. Is that correct? So, it, it, so there's a number of ways we can do it. Um, basically, you introduce the bill. It sits on the notice paper. The government would bring it on itself, which is unlikely to do. Um, or we basically, during normal procedure, proceedings in the House, suspend standing orders, uh, to bring it on for debate, um, which would mean having coalition MPs, you know, either abstain from voting um, or vote across the floor to vote for a debate. We hope through this committee that we will allow, it, that we, you know, the government would allow debate on it. Um, so, we'd need people to either the government to endorse it or people to cross the floor or abstain um, to, to debate it. And it would be the same with passing the legislation. So we'd need that in the house and the Senate. Senate's a bit easier because you just need one abstention um, from a coalition member. Cause we're pretty, we're pretty sure we've already got the support in the Senate. Um, or we could tack the bill on to other legislation going through the house and the Senate, but that's not what we want to do. Um, so yeah, there are some obstacles to overcome, uh, but you know, little by little we're making progress and, um, just basically see, it's kind of choose your own adventure. Um, politics is very rapidly moving. Nobody, I mean, we knew the coronavirus was going to be bad, but a lot of people probably didn't realize it's going to be this bad and it's turned politics on its head. So a lot can happen. Uh, over the next couple, um, you know, next year and even next two years that could make the passage of the bill viable. It could take a number of attempts. Um, you know, in the UK, it was introduced in 2005 as a private member's bill and to, in 2008 became law. So it's an ongoing, it's a, it's a process and it may not happen overnight. So we, 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 we'll, 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 we'll try whatever we can. That's, that's just great being able to hear you talk through that, Harry. There's 
I've got two more people and a possible third. Can we... So and several hams coming up there too, Catherine. Yes. I've seen Penny really so waving Paula. hard. She's desperate to say something. <laughs> Paula's waited so patiently, and I think Peter Todd has a question, and then I'll line up the others. Okay. Um, Paul, can... Oh. I was hoping we might unmute you. Why can I not unmute? Can okay, we hear can you? you? Yes. Can you hear yes. me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, earlier in, in your talk, you spoke about what was going on generally in the, uh, as a re result of the, um, a coronavirus and that it's likely to last a couple of years and my feeling about that is that um, not only is life going to change politically but life is going to change for us all and um, that the, the, the focus then of things like economic stimulus um, will probably need to have a very different focus than it is getting at the moment. So, for example, um, as you've said, everybody is sort of battening down the hatches. So uh, our, our focus is not on, in my opinion, you know, buying a new car, investing in a new, new property, getting new white goods and so on and so forth. We're, we're more likely as a total community to move our expenditure to things like health, food, utilities, the basics of life. And as a consequence of that, not only will our attitude and our lifestyle change, but it means that the demands on our economy will change in that we won't be demanding the services of car yards um, and so on and so forth. So there are certain aspects of employment which not only will suffer during this period, but will actually, the need for them will be greatly reduced. And I think that's going to happen in the first six months uh, of the direct impact of this virus, but it will have a knock on impact then on the economy over the following uh, 18 months. So we, we then have a, a very different situation about what our lifestyle will be. And I feel that then in this two year period, there's actually an opportunity because of people's mindsets focusing much more on, on basics and family. And it will be more family orientated because we're all living as families now rather than our wider communities, our social groups. That um, it's an opportunity for us to then focus more on things like getting solar panels on our roofs because that will reduce our expenditure long term. And we'll discover through this process that reducing your operational expenditure is actually a bloody good thing to do. Paul, I'm going to um, take that as a comment. <laughs> you've, um, I think you've expressed a lot of what other people are thinking. Um, Peter, your question. question. Uh, you're muted, Peter. Just, I'll also say, Paul, I agree with you. So, so. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to give you the information, Harry, that uh, we did have 20 face-to-face uh, -face meetings with MPs uh, for early this week. And right. uh, with what's happening, we've been able to convert at least eight, eight of those to phone conferences. So we're still right. trying to, to communicate uh, with MPs. And obviously, uh, the climate change bill will be a part of that. Uh, those discussions that will still be going ahead. Fantastic! That's great. That's great. Thanks, Peter. And he's waving a hand there again. And I know Arif and he's saying Brian are keen <laughs> to somebody. Else. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I think we're just about there. Over to you, Tom. Well, uh, we've got a couple more. I know Penny is keen to talk. I know our ref is certainly keen. He's been very persistent there. And Brian, I don't know whether he's frozen in that position, but he's had his hand up for a long time. 
So very quick questions from you guys, if you would. We'll have all three questions and then back to Harry. Firstly, oh. you, Penny. Hi, um, we're in Hume electorate. We're curious, um, Harry, the numbers that have signed Zali's bill, do you have a breakdown of where those votes are coming, or sorry, well, those signings are coming from? You know, are there so many in different electorates? Do you have any indication like that? We are in Hume and we've had 300 sign, which doesn't sound very many, but perhaps in the scheme of things, it may actually be quite a lot, depending where the other signing people are coming from. Do you have any breakdown of that? Um, on the climateappnow.com.au, there actually is a breakdown. So you can go further down the page um, past the initial counter. They'll have a state by state and electorate by electorate leaderboard. Um, and I'm not really, I haven't checked it lately, but I think, I think Warringah is leading. I think we're leading, but I think, I think um, electorate of, the division of Sydney, which is Tanya Plibersek is second, second division of Melbourne, which is Adam Bant's third. Um, and then there's some, you know, there's some interesting figures in there in terms of, you know, coalition backbencher seats where they're marginal and, you know, a thousand people, a thousand voters have, have signed up, which actually is a lot for a marginal seat. Um, your seat, Hume, is, you know, obviously Angus Taylor's seat. It's interesting. I encourage you to continue to generate, you know, my parents have a property in, in Sutton Forest. So I uh, spent a lot of time in the division of Hume. Um, and it would be really, really good to see um, more climate action down there. Doesn't know, I don't know if it's really registered yet. This, it seems to be quite conservative still down there, but keep, keep going hard. Um, it'd be, yeah, it'd be good even to see an independent down there. Yeah, they're doing well in June. They've had meetings of 70 to 100 people at a time each month, Harrison. Right. You'd be pleased to know in Goulburn. Yep. yep, sorry. I keep losing my camera. Keep, sorry. Harris. Sorry. Um, How yeah, you so it goes back to the coming to the floor. I'm just saying historically, if you look at it, they told us that like in the past few years, the main independent bill that's ever been passed for Parliament was Karen Phelps' uh, refugee, bill, refugee bill from last mm -hmm. year. And that was only yeah. because there was a three-month period where Labour plus independents could have a bigger vote than mm -hmm. the Liberals mm -hmm. and the coalition. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is the same-sex marriage bill with, where it just wasn't just pushed by, I'm not saying it was an independent bill, but it wasn't pushed by only mm -hmm. one person. It was like multiple mm -hmm. people brought that bill forward. So, mm -hmm. And the other thing that we heard was that there's a scrutiny of bills committee, which is labor, liberal majority. They won't even let it approach the floor. So that's what a labor MP, Matt Thistleway, told us. That's their perspective. So we're asking for Matt, like, mm -hmm. can you support Zalik's bill? And they're like, it won't even make the floor. They won't even well, let well, it to be debated. And I was like, mm -hmm. couldn't we find like some climate friendly liberals? And they were like, they will squash it instantly. Matt will probably be given his, his orders by um, the caucus. Um, Labor have a different, they don't really have a free vote. So Labor vote is a block. So Matt will either vote or not vote with it. Um, so he won't really have a choice. Um, in terms of what his, the, the scrutiny of bills committee actually looks at the legal drafting of bills. So it looks at, you know, how the explanatory memorandum and the legislation is worded. So it's what, I think he's talking about the selection committee. Um, it's already passed the selection committee. So it's already on the notice paper, which means it's already, you know, on the agenda for when we want to bring it on. So there's no hurdle there. Um, I agree with you historically, it's very, very difficult for a private member's bill to get up. I mean, you can count on two hands how many have ever gotten up. Yeah, same-sex marriage was one, initiated by a private senator, uh, a liberal senator, I think. Um, but, there's a number of different ways this can happen, this bill. So like, it's not just, and, and actually the Medivac wasn't a private member's bill. It was a private member's amendment to a government bill that was being pushed through. So they, they stuck it onto another bill, which is another way you can do it. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you've been following the, the debate on the national integrity commission legislation. So, um, so national, national, you know, you, I don't know if you're aware of a, a, an integrity commission as a concept, but New South Wales, South Australia, Victoria, they all have integrity commissions which investigate um, allegations of corruption by um, government officials and bodies and whatever, members of parliament. We don't have one at a federal level. So um, uh, two years ago, Cathy McGowan, who was the member for Indi before uh, Helen Haynes, independent, introduced a private member's bill, National Integrity Commission bill, 
that's still alive to this day. It keeps getting um, it keeps getting introduced in the Senate by the Greens and by everybody and in the House, and so it's it's been floating around for two years. And in that two years, the government uh, have actually uh, adopted its concept and are proposing its their own National Integrity Commission due to the pressure that we put on them. So independence and, and minor parties. So it's probably more likely that it, it could be adopted by the government as a primary bill. And um, with the National Integrity Commission bill, um, we're actually getting a lot. Uh, um, you know, we're getting a lot of the, 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 the features of the bill that we want. Um, so, you know, as I said before, there's a number of, number of choose your own adventures in this, in this world where the government could adopt it. We could get people to cross the floor we could tack it on to another bill. It's really fluid and we've just got to respond to the situation as it arises, but nothing in politics is like a game of four dimensional chess I've found. So anything can happen. Okay. We're actually running a little over time there now, uh, but uh, there's a couple, there's one very important question and Brian's had his hand up for a long time. Uh, Brian, is yours a very quick one, please? I'll unmute you. There you go. Hello. Uh, first of all, Hello, thank man. you very much for all the excellent work you've done to prepare this bill and your being here today. And I feel uh, compelled to ask on behalf of a few other people what your view is on the Parliamentary Friends of uh, Climate Solutions. Uh, do you know what it is and do you think it could be very useful for the process? Thank you. And the other Thanks, question Brian. that I have online here is that uh, is that supporting the bill? Are you aware of it and are they involved? Yeah, so the private, uh, the Parliamentary Friends of Climate Action, we're actually co, co deputy chair of the, of the Parliamentary Friends of, so we're, we've been helping convene events. So we sponsored um, in Parliament um, last for, sitting fortnight, the Clean Energy Council to come in and host a special event on on um, a special con a summit on um, regional development and, and, and renewable energy and that kind of stuff. So we're very much, we're very much involved in the parliamentary friends of group. Um, we intend to hold more events. Um, uh, it, is it, a, is it a, is it a, a, a good vehicle? I think so. I think it exposes a lot of MPs to material and content that they were ne not aware of before that they can use. I certainly noticed at this Clean Energy Council summit we had that a lot of liberal backbenchers were there. Um, I won't name them because it was a closed door meeting, um, but it was really, really encouraging that they were involved. So it's a really good educational, um, uh, educational forum and, and, and good forum for MPs to also mix with people they don't usually mix with, health professionals who are concerned about climate renewable energy developers, investors, and this is all kind of building the case. So it's been, it's good. It's a really good thing. And I'm looking forward to when we resume. And I think the next one that I really want to pursue is um, um, sustainable investing, um, climate related risk disclosure from a private sector point of view. So bringing down investors and C-level executives to discuss about how their co companies and uh, perform, uh, you know, uh, uh, responding to climate risk. And I really want to do that. Um, in terms of supporting the bill, we didn't want to have the parliamentary friends of climate action come out endorsing the bill because that's not, it's not the appropriate vehicle we want. Um, although the, all the members are of the uh, uh, parliamentary friends of group are aware of the bill, we wanted to keep it as a forum to discuss ideas and host events. We didn't want it to become partisan or political. So we don't intend to have it as a, a sponsor for the bill. Right, that makes good sense. Uh, we, however, you'll be pleased to know, have decided uh, in CCL that we will be supporting the bill and we will be asking, where appropriate, the politicians we meet with to support it in any way they can, uh, right from right. Uh, actually, uh, directly supporting it to uh, at least abstaining if they can't make a uh, a direct contribution, but uh, in, in any way that they Thank can. You. So, yes, we, we really appreciate you joining us this afternoon, Harrison. I think there'd probably be more questions if we let it run, but we really do have to finish at that point. And uh, 
Well, yep, yeah, we really applaud what you're doing and would, would you pass our thanks back to Zali for all she's doing to her. Absolutely. Thank you.